So in this video, I want to give you an introduction to the autonomic nervous system, and I will mainly focus on the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So let's first ask, what is the autonomic nervous system doing and why do we have it? The autonomic nervous system is the portion of the nervous system that controls the major visceral functions of the body, such as heart rate, blood pressure, digestion, secretion, sweating, pupillary apparatus. Basically, all the autonomic functions of our body, all the automatic functions, things we don't need to worry about. If we climb up the stairs after lecture, we don't need to think, oh, I better increase my heart rate now not to pass out. Or if we wake up in the middle of the night to find the bathroom, we don't need to think, oh, I better dilate my pupils now to be able to find the bathroom. All that things are taking care of the autonomic nervous system. You probably know that the autonomic nervous system is anatomically divided into two divisions, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is activated when you are under emotional stress or under physical stress. The sympathetic nervous system equips you for the worst case scenario. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, we often call this our fight and flight response. In contrast, when our stress level is very low and when we feel very comfortable, the part of the autonomic nervous system that is predominantly working is the parasympathetic nervous system. This is also a lot of times referred as our rest and digest mode. So let's look more closely what is happening if the sympathetic nervous system is activating. So you are in fight and flight and are under stress. So the nice thing about what is happening in all the different organs when the sympathetic nervous system is activated that you can predict all of them if you just think what is happening if I'm running away from a lion. So let's start with the eyes. So the pupils need to be dilated. Why do they need to be dilated? Because if you have a dilated pupil you can also see in the dark because a dilated pupil can collect more light and you are equipped with a fight and flight response for the worst case scenario. So the lion could attack you in the dark. So you need to be able to see in the dark. So that's why your pupils are dilated. Then you accommodate for far vision because in a fight and flight response, it's way more important to see if there's another lion attacking you and there's another lion coming. So you need to accommodate for far vision. You don't need to read a book now, so there's no need for accommodating for near vision. Then your bronchioles need to be dilated. And that also makes sense because you want to collect as much oxygen as possible to run away from the lion. Then when you're running away, you're going to sweat. Sweating is increased when you're going to run away from the lion. And that makes sense because when you run away, your body temperature is going to go up and you need to get rid of body temperature Otherwise, you're going to develop fever and you don't want to have a fever when you're running away from the lion. And after all, if you're sweating, it's maybe also harder for the lion to really to get a grasp on you. Heart rate and heart force are going to be increased because you want to make sure that you can pump a lot of blood through your body, that you can run away from the lion. Then, in terms of metabolism, we're going to have an increased gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Why is that? Well, if you run away from the lion, you want to have glucose now because it's not a good time to pass out because of hypoglycemia. So you need to make sure that you have good glucose levels. And how can you make glucose? Well, you can make it from scratch. That's called gluconeogenesis. Or you can break down glycogen. That's called glycogenolysis. Then, what's going to happen in the GI tract? It's definitely not a good time to digest. So peristalsis is going to be slowed down. Then it's also not a good time to defecate and urinate now. So sphincters are going to be tight. Sphincters are going to be closed. So for the bladder, we don't want to urinate now. So we need to make sure that the bladder can fill as much as we can so, so that the trussor needs to relax. The last thing are the blood vessels. 
This is a little bit complicated because it depends on the location of the blood vessel. If you want to talk about blood vessel in viscera in the skin, there's going to be vasoconstriction because we don't need there a lot of blood. After all, the lion could bite you and you don't want to lose a lot of blood when it bites your skin. So there's no need to have a lot of blood in skin and viscera. However, we want to have a lot of blood flow to the skeletal muscle, for example, to run away from the lion. So therefore, we're going to have vasodilation of the blood vessels to the skeletal muscle. So it depends on the location of the blood vessel if you're going to get vasoconstriction or vasodilation. The next thing that we need to understand is which receptors are mediating which of the responses. Because we have a lot of drugs that act at different adrenergic receptors, and so we need to understand what's going to happen if we stimulate them or if we block them. So we when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, we're going to release a lot of norepinephrine and epinephrine. And these are also called, in European countries, noradrenaline and adrenaline. And they bind to so-called adrenergic receptors. That's where the word comes from. So adrenergic receptors came, come in two flavors. We have an alpha and beta receptor. Then within the alpha receptors, we have alpha-1 and alpha-2. And within the beta receptors, we have beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3. These are all G-protein coupled receptors. And importantly, we have all flavors of G-protein coupled receptors represented within the adrenergic receptors. Alpha-1 is coupled to GQ, alpha-2 is coupled to GI, and then all the betas are GS coupled receptors. How can we now figure out which receptor is mediating which responses? So I would always start thinking first about beta-1 receptor, because the beta-1 receptor is the most specific receptor in terms of the location. Beta-1 receptors are only on the heart and in the kidney. So whatever happens to the heart or to the kidney, it's going to be beta-1 mediated. So you're already done with beta-1. Then. There's alpha-2. I would not worry too much about alpha-2 because it's mainly found presynaptically and it modulates the different responses. So it has more of a modulatory function and not a primary effector function. Therefore, let's don't worry too much about it. Beta-3 is a newer one and we don't know so much about it. It might have a lot of implications in metabolism. But we also don't worry too much about it. So we're going to start to alpha-1 and beta-2 now. Alpha-1 is coupled to GQ that leads to an increase in calcium and that can mediate either blood vessel constriction or smooth muscle contractions. In contrast, and this is kind of the opposing receptor, we have beta-2, which is GS coupled. And once we stimulate beta-2 receptors, we're going to get vasodilation or smooth muscle dilation. So those receptors have completely opposing effects. So let's go back to our original slide and put in the correct receptors to the different organ responses. So let's start talking about beta-1 first, because beta-1 is only found in the heart and in the kidney. So we're already done with beta-1 because we know the effects in the heart are mediated by beta-1. Right now, we don't worry about the kidney. It mediates renin release that we'll be discussed in a different video. Let's go on further. We said we don't worry too much about alpha-2 because it has only modulatory function. It's so then let's worry about beta-2 and alpha-1. We said alpha-1 is mediating smooth muscle contraction and beta-2 smooth muscle dilation. So let's start with the bronchioles. We know that they dilate, so it needs to be beta-2 mediated. Let's continue with the GI tract and the bladder. So we know that when we run away from the lion, there is no time to digest now. So therefore, the peristalsis of the GI system needs to slow down, so there's relaxation. Therefore, that needs to be mediated by beta-2. Same for the bladder, the detrusor muscle needs to relax because we want to fill the bladder as much as we can so that we're not going to urinate now because there's no time for defecation urination 
And because of this reason, the sphincters needs to be tight. The sphincters needs to be closed. So there needs to be an alpha-1 effect because there's smooth muscle contraction. So let's go on to the blood vessel. Here it depends on the location. If we are talking about blood vessels that go to skeletal muscle, they need to dilate. We're going to have vasodilation because we want to bring as much blood as possible to the skeletal muscle to run away from the lion. However, blood vessels in the skin and viscera, they are vasoconstrict because there is no need for extra blood there. So that needs to be an alpha-1 effect because that always mediates vasoconstriction. You can also think about it that it's not a good idea to have a lot of blood flow in the skin because after all you can be bitten by the lion and you don't want to lose a lot of blood. So, so blood vessel and skin and viscera constrict. So the only other thing that we need to discuss is sweating. We know that we sweat when we run away from the lion because when you're running away body temperature goes up. And so we sweat in order to not develop fever. Although sweating is under sympathetic innovation, please remember that the neurotransmitter that is released onto the sweat gland is acetylcholine. So that's an exemption because normally the sympathetic nervous system uses at the neuroeffector junction norepinephrine or epinephrine. But for sweating, it's so called sympathetic cholinergic, innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, but uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. So therefore, this effect is mediated by the M3 receptor, a muscarinic receptor, for which acetylcholine is the ligand. So besides the eye that I will discuss in a separate video, we, we have now predicted all the different responses and the receptor that is mediating these responses. This concludes the video on the activation of the sympathetic nervous system.